Welcome back, everyone. Shane from Supercon here. I am so honored and pleased to be joined by um, award-winning author, creator, artist, Kazu Kazu Kibuishi. God dang it! You know I had it. You want to start over? Embarrassed. Okay. I do because I actually, I actually have an editor, but we're going to start over. Kibu. Kibuishi. Yeah. Got it. Kibu I don't. I, I froze up completely. All right, we'll start over in three, All two, right. one. Hi everyone, Shane from Supercon back. Uh, thanks for tuning back in. I am so pleased and honored to be uh, joined by award-winning author artist, uh, creator, Kazu Kibayushi, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, from uh, Seattle area, from Washington area. Glad you're safe, and uh, welcome to Supercon Live. Hey, thanks. Yeah, glad to be here. It's good. Yeah. And, we're, and I'm safe. I'm not, uh, I'm not, in, not in the middle of the fire, so I'm good. Um, we, we are getting some, we're getting some smoke, but, you know, so is everyone. Um, I think I think the the thing about uh, being up in this area is that we we're not used to having air conditioning when people don't need it, you know, because we're by the water and stuff, and um, and so people are stuck in their homes with fans with filters on them and stuff. So it's it's gotten crazy at the Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> I was just there and I, I saw everybody walking out with the filters. <laughs> sure, sure, I'm sure, absolutely. I I have to say that. Uh, uh, I came to your work through my 12 year old son. Um, he was 10 years old and uh, I have been a comic book collector and, and a uh, devourer of sequential art since I was eight. My father fed me comic books and, and uh, to inspire my reading. And so I've done the same with Derek and I would share books that I thought were important for, with him. And he brought me Amulet and said, dad, you need to read this. So that's how I was introduced to you and, and, uh, I'm so glad you did because what a beautiful world you've created, uh, Kazu. Talk, can you share with us the uh, inspiration and the creative uh, uh, process that went into creating this beautiful world of Amulet? Yeah, um, yeah. It's um, if I if I had to, you know, of course, with most artists and writers, you have like a huge mix of of influences and things like that 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 come into the work. Um, but if I had to clearly delineate what was it that, that really started my um, uh, journey on, on, on to making Amulet, I think I, I, would, um, I would go back to reading Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind by Hayao sure. Miyazaki. So I, um, I hadn't read a book like that before. Um, I, I had, um, so for so long, I, I, was, I was drawing comics in middle school and high school at a pretty high level. And pe people were already offering me jobs right out of, um, right out of high school, um, you know, whether it was working at Image Comics or, um, you know, just various independent publishers. Uh, I, I, I was getting um, work offer uh, for the stuff that I was doing back then. However, I didn't read anything that was coming out that felt like the kind of books that I wanted to make. I, I didn't know if they even existed because I really wanted to make something literary that was drawn. I, I, I loved comics in general. I do love superhero comics. I was a big fan of them when I was, when I was drawing them in high school. Um, but a lot of it, I was, I, I, there, was, there was a vision that I had for a longer form all ages <laughs> adventure story and I didn't see much of that until I saw Bone by Jeff Smith and yeah. that that you know that that grabbed me and I immediately thought man I really want to do um I, I really want to do something like um like what what this artist is doing and then um I found um and then I found uh Nausicaa the Valley of the Wind while I was in college and I read those in one sitting um and I, at the end of it <laughs> I think it was just a, just one long day, you know, it was like, um, in the movie, never ending story. <laughs> and when, yeah. when Bastion's reading the books, and that's what it, that's what it was like for me reading that. And, you know, I was in a party town cause I was in UC Santa Barbara. So everybody's partying all the time. Um, I wasn't, I was working all the time, <laughs> most of the time. And, uh, I was reading, uh, I, I got to the end of Nausicaa towards the, towards sunset. And I remember being in tears. And I, um, um, you know, and, and my friend asked me what's wrong. And I just said, I just, I was in tears because I was like, this is the, it's not even sad. 
<laughs> the story to me, it wasn't sad necessarily. I just think I read what I want to do with my life, something like this. And so yeah. I had to come back to the, and so I, I, when I'm making Amulet, I didn't expect Amulet to be that project. I, was, I thought it was going to be a practice run before I actually tackled the project of the scale that um, Nausicaa depicts. But, um, you know, one thing led to another and ended up becoming something like Nausicaa. And I've made, made a way, I've, I've, I've pretty much fashioned the project into, into another book like Nausicaa and Bone. So I'm just following those two books. Those are my two biggest inspirations. If I had to, if I had to pinpoint anything, that would be it. Every creator I've spoken to has that, that book or that moment or that uh, song, whatever it may be that, that is their aha moment. And, and, you know, for, I mean, Nausicaa is a transformative work. I mean, it, it, it touches uh, so many emotions, you know, and, and Bone, of course, uh, you know, all ages, the quest story that is, you know, timeless, you know, there's quest stories throughout history, um, but, but it touched it in a different way. And, and now that you've said those two things, I see both those influences in Amulet, but yet Amulet is something onto its own. Um, it, it, it feels like when we, when we begin the story, it feels like this is an established world already. Was that mm. purposeful? I mean, did you, do you have a, a Bible, so to speak, of, of what happens in the world, what the world is, or is it just flowing out as you write? Um, well, I mean, I'm glad that you feel that way <laughs> about the story, but I actually, I, 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 um, I just kind of rolled into it in, in this. I was in, wow. in that way. I was just, I was sort of discovering the world with the characters. However, I was trying to write it back in the nineties. So I've been with this, I've been with this particular story for a long time. I didn't really think too much about where the, what the, would be in the world. I, I actually feel like in my next project, I've already done so much more research and so much more, I put so much more thought into what the world's going to be like. Um, but with Amulet, I, I did, I, I thought more mostly about the characters. The characters have been with me for a long, long time. The world changes around them quite a bit. And I used to be, you know, uh, somebody who worked in animation. So you're, I was doing concept art storyboards. I was just making stuff all the time. So ha having to do that for Amulet wasn't really that wasn't a stretch, you know, for me, like the world building is something that I was hired to do all the time. Um, now I was able to do it for my projects. And I would actually say that I actually had less time to do any world building for my own work because I'm so busy doing everything else <laughs> that, <laughs> that I was just like, okay, this will work. This is just, this is good enough. Let's just go. Let's just, let's just get it in there so we can get the book done because the, the, the cycle of production for the first five, six books, the five, first five books of Amulet was intense. I remember thinking as we were going through it and I was like seven years into doing that, right? Because we started at 2005. I believe that's when I started working on Amulet um, uh, specifically for Scholastic. Um, I started working on it on my own in 1997, but for, for Scholastic, I was working in 2005. The book comes out, the first one comes out 2008 and then one year after each of those, the, the first books, um, there, the, the books came out like one, one year after another. Uh, after five books, and I was, I was working crazy hours. I, I didn't know if I could, I, I didn't know how I could possibly keep doing it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so at that pace, I just really had no time to do any research for my book. I didn't really have time to, you know, thankfully I had enough front loaded and preloaded from about eight years of de development when I wasn't a comic artist, I was working in the corporate world. I was working in all these different jobs. I was thinking about it for about eight years before I got a chance to do it. And that was enough to fill five books of content. Now, as I got to the later books, I had to really think things through and change, change and I had to change my pace. So it's been a little bit slower. Yeah, exactly. It, there's almost a hunger, uh, for uh, consumption of it. And, and once you put it out there, I mean, th there's the expectation, when's the next chapter? When's the next book? When's this coming? And, mm -hmm. and deadline is real. I mean, for sure. Uh, I, I love the fact that you were discovering the world with the characters, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, okay, where are they going? Uh, what are they going to see? What's the next step? 
you know, and, and that's, that's a unique process, Kazu, because so many people, well, I know what happened to the characters before the story started, and after the story's done, I know what's going to happen afterwards. So this discovery of uh, the world with them is very interesting to me. Yeah, I actually wanted the feeling of discovery to be a big part of Amulet, and I think that's what drives, it brings people back to reading it, is just feel, you feel that when you read the books, I think that you feel like I'm excited about it. And if that's the case, then you're going to feel that way. So I, I'm trying to, it's like, it's like method acting or something. <laughs> I try right, to put right, myself yeah. in a, a place where I'm, you know, I want to get my headspace in the arena when I'm making the book. And if I'm just following plans, I'm not in the, I'm not on, in the game. I'm just not in the arena with the characters, with all the chaos of making the book. Um, you know, I, I, I like it. I like, I like being in the middle of that. And, and I, I like seeing what results when I do something like that. So I, I write a little differently than like my wife, for example, she scripts everything and she's like so much more organized and I'm sure Scholastic, <laughs> Scholastic loves working with her and like, and, and for, and then when it comes to Kazu, they're just like, Oh my, my goodness, here comes Kazu's book. Uh, hopefully, there's, <laughs> hopefully, I think hopefully, hopefully he, he finishes this thing and there's a book <laughs> for some reason he's done it eight times somehow. And it always looked like a total disaster on the way in. Um, and it's true. Every one of these books, I mean, they, they laugh about it. It's classic. Oh, the people who've been with me long enough, they go, it seems like Kazu doesn't know what he's doing, but for some reason it shows the final book shows up <laughs> and it's, and it's great. <laughs> and I think that that's just kind of the way I, I work. And I think that's how a lot of filmmakers work, in fact, because I used to be a film major um, in school and I, I wanted to be a live action filmmaker. And one of the things that I didn't like when I was making live action films was I didn't like what I was putting everybody through who was on the set that didn't, like who wasn't on the journey and like in a, in a really invested way, like the way I was. I felt like putting people in danger, <laughs> putting people <laughs> in danger on the set felt irresponsible for me in my mind i just felt i felt it was rude <laughs> so I, I i knew that as a live action director i was gonna have a hard time being a foreman on the set because i just i didn't like pushing people around now with comics i have one assistant who's been with me for about 12 years now <laughs> And he gets pushed around by me, <laughs> but, but he knows what this is. He, he knows how hard this is. Like he knows he's gone through the process with me so many times ever since uh, he started on the, in the middle of Amulet 2. And okay. with Jason, he understands, he understands what we're going to go through to make one of these books. And it is intense. Um, so much so that in the last book, that number eight, both Jason and I had to just clear out away from comics just so we can get our brains back because we were so physically and mentally exhausted um, mm -hmm. that we were, you know, I think, you know, it just, we, it took a long time for us to even look at a comic book again. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was, I was just speaking with uh, uh, Tom Wynn and, and it's people don't understand the, well, I think some do, but it's, it's, it's hard to express. This is part of me that you're getting. This is part of you know my creation that I've given to you. And he said the same thing: the physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion when you when you're up against a deadline and you have to get the work done, um, and and then the outpouring. You know, it that it, it's it's got to be uh, almost cathartic at the end and and relief, but yet knowing that the next one's coming. Yeah, I, 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 um, I guess it is cathartic. I mean, I, I keep thinking that it's going to feel really good. And usually <laughs> it doesn't really register with me when I get to the end. So, I, you know, when I'm done, I'm just like, oh, okay, well, now that's done. So now the storm, okay. has, the storm has passed. But I'm not re necessarily relieved. I feel like there's so much more to do all the time. <laughs> okay. So okay. I, I'm just already, I'm already thinking ahead to the next thing. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I keep thinking it's going to be a sense of relief. I really do. But I realize that it's not coming. So I, I have to take breaks during all, like when, anytime, just anytime. I, like, I don't know if you see it on my social media. I, I'm like, out. I just was yeah. going to wake surfing yesterday, you know? Yeah. And I, if, I, if I have a friend who just says, come on, we're going to take our, our buddy's boat out and we're going to do some wake surfing. I'm like, okay, let's go. Let's just do it. 
you know, I, I've got work to do, but you know, I need to, I need to live too. So yeah, you have to take time for yourself. Yeah. You have to schedule time for yourself and take time for yourself. Absolutely. So what, how much of you, is there a character that is more you than others in this kazoo? Um, gosh, I think they're all me. <laughs> different different yeah, parts different of your personality? Facets. Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, I don't know. There's, it, it's hard. I mean, I, I, I suppose Emily's got, I mean, some traits. Naven, definitely. Um, I'd say I, I'd say I, I identify a lot with Naven. Um, so so does my my brother. My brother and me are like Naven, you know. And we we had like we had two little sisters that we always took care of, you know. And I, I don't know. I feel with Emily's story. So like I feel like um, Naven handles more of the physical story, the physical presence yeah. of the story, and then and then. Emily's working on the emotional and the internal side of the story. So they're both kind of two parts of the same person in a way. And so I don't know, I think that um, I think that I do relate to both of them. Um, as far as side characters, I always think of myself as being a bit like Leon Redbeard, but my wife says that I'm actually more like Miskit. So <laughs> I'm going to take her word for it. Uh, it's always the perception, you know, I'm this, and then our wives are like, yes, no, yes, no, you're I'm really not. not. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just the, yeah, the stuffed animal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, cud, the cuddly stuffed animal, not the warrior fox. <laughs> uh, what, uh, what books did you read uh, as, as a young adult or as a young reader um, that, that sparked your interest in comics and in animation? Um, let's see. Um, I'd say Garfield. I think that's oh, the one Jim I started David. it. Yeah, Jim Davis. That's, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think Jim Davis and Garfield. Um, um, you know, Hank Ketchum and Dennis the Menace, Dennis the Menace. was there. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I was reading. Um, I was reading. Um, you know, uh, Heathcliff as well. Was uh, who's the artist? Uh, it was gosh. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't think of his name right now either. Not the. Uh, oh my goodness, I can't even believe I, I don't remember. Is it Gordon? Oh my goodness! <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> I, I got yeah. caught on video, not not knowing that. That's okay. That's that is okay. bad. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was I was reading, you know, because I would always go to the to the book fairs to find Garfield, and uh, and then I'll um, pick up Heathcliff if I could if I couldn't find um, if I couldn't get Garfield because oftentimes Garfield was the first one that was sold out, and then I you know uh, buy Bill Keen's Family Circus and then Marmaduke and. Uh, anything that had cartoons in it. So I used to read cartoons all the time. Mad Magazine was huge for me. So more George, George Gately. George, George Gately. George Gately, that is right. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. I, I had to look up too because it was killing me as well. So I had to pull up my other screen here and look okay. quickly. George yeah, so Gately, lots of, yeah. Lots of strip, lots of a, uh, animated strip work was uh, influential on you. Yeah, Bill Pete, Bill Pete's uh, children's books. Uh, the yeah. Caboose Who Got Loose, that was, that was my favorite. I always, I always really liked uh, Bill Pete's, um, Bill Pete's uh, drawing skill. Like he had such a good sense of perspective in cartoons. Um, that was something that was that was that was new to me at the time. Was seeing cartoons drawn in like a really realistic way. Like it wasn't, they weren't realistic, but they looked like they could exist. And mm -hmm. um, and so Bill Pete was so good at it, and partly because of his animation background. He, he could, you know, he could do turnarounds of everything inside of his books. Um, I thought the Stylistic writing realism. was the, yeah. word, the best, but, you know, I thought the art was fantastic, and, I, and I, I tried to emulate Bill Pete's style. So I think Bill Pete's work, Mort Drucker, and Jim Davis, I think those three artists were the ones that really started it for me. Jim Davis, that's interesting. Those early Garfield strips were dark. They were, uh, there was some cynicism in those early strips that, that later on, as, as the character became more popular, uh, there was much more physical humor. And, and uh, uh, but those early ones were a little bit dark, like you know, well, uh, which I, I, I found would, interesting. Yeah, I think I think all comedy is dark. Uh, sure. I think there's sure. a darkness to. It. I mean, when I read Calvin and Hobbes too, I think it's very mm -hmm. bittersweet and sad and dark. I feel bad for Calvin. 
in, 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 in a lot of ways. I feel like he's, sure. he's very alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, and I read his, as a dad, now as a dad, it's, I read the comics differently as a, than I did as a kid. When I yeah. read it as a kid, it was like celebration of childhood or something. And I, as I read it as an adult, I'm like, where are the parents? <laughs> like, yeah. come on, like, why are they, why are they so mad at Calvin? He's wonderful. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. just like appreciate this guy, you know, and, and he's now alone. He has to imagine his friends. And so I think it's really sad. And like Far Side, I mean, I feel like Gary Larson's Far Side was so good. I mean, you look back at that, it's like such a dark side of humanity. <laughs> yeah, very <laughs> much so dark. Yeah. 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 So um, I think I I, comedy and darkness go hand in hand. That's why I don't I want to do, do comedy. As well. I don't do comedy. <laughs> I just, no. I just, I have, I pepper it in there, but I, yeah. I honestly have to do something like sweet and sincere because it's just comedy's, uh, comedy's rough on the soul. The, uh, I, I'm a huge fan of, of Charles Schultz. Uh, oh yes. Um, Charles, yeah, Charlie too. Brown is Charlie Brown Sparky. is my av avatar, you know, um, uh, hope and always getting up the next day. And What's the greatest there comedy a, There's there is a sadness to those as well. Oh, it's, know, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Are you kidding? Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah, peanuts yeah. is like the melancholy of peanuts yeah. is like I don't know. It's legendary, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. It really is. Yeah. But but yet tinged with hope, right? At the end of the day, yeah. Charlie Brown always gets back up. He always is on the mound opening day. He always tries to kick the football again, you mm -hmm. know. So, so was there's this melancholy tinged with hope. So, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, I'm fascinated by the number of, of uh, Judd Winnick talked about that as well. It was comic strips. It was it was the Saturday uh, daily strips and then the Sunday color strips that yeah. really inspired his style as well. Yeah, um, it, yeah. That's oh, that's I mean, interesting. Was, you both went YA, so that's very interesting too. Yeah, and I'm I don't I actually I don't think we are YA. I, I think we're middle grade, which is it's it's I think it's sure. very different than YA. Uh, but yeah, it uh, is. It is. You're right. You're right. Yeah. 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 But um, but we didn't have comics like ours, you know, before we started making them. So when I started, like, I just didn't, there wasn't much in the way, I mean, even, even if I knew Jeff Smith or, or like before, or around the time I started Amulet, around that time we, I got to meet him and he told me like his books weren't meant for kids, you know, and with Amulet, I really did want to write for young readers. I, I think Jeff's work plays well with all ages because it's, I mean, Jeff, if you, if anybody's known him, he's just so, he's an all, he's an, he's a, all person person, you know, he's a, somebody everyone can love, you know, and I think it comes through in his work. So then kids can enjoy it just as well as the adults. Um, but it wasn't intended, I think. Um, and so I didn't, we didn't really have much that was like intentionally made for kids on a, like, like epic, epic fantasy stories made for no, kids. There, just, there was like almost nothing. Um, and it's why I switched to doing it, but I got so much flack for, changing tracks from daisy cutter i did daisy cutter first sure yeah and yep. i and and I, that was like super critically acclaimed um you know in the comics world and it was kind of put up there as like it was compared to watchmen and and to um into hellboy and it was in that you know that vein of things which i enjoyed i personally enjoyed it but i was looking at the landscape and i thought how come nobody's doing kids comics like if we don't do comics for new readers coming into this, then this, this thing is going away. <laughs> There's going to be no readers. So Absolutely. I switched, I switched gears. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there was a time when, when I believe, and, and I stepped away from comics for a while because they got so dark, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I was just rereading some of the old and there was a time when, when comics were written specifically for all ages, but you know, they weren't, you weren't written down to, but anyone of any age could pick them up. And then there was a turning point where they are adult themed and they are darker and edgier. And, and you're right. There wasn't anything out there specifically for that. You know, uh, Scrooge McDuck was gone. Uh, Richie mm -hmm. Rich, all, all that stuff that as a child I saw, mm -hmm. which was age specific, all of that was gone. And there was no fantasy at all. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Tintin and Asterix, mm -hmm. maybe, but still those have adult themes. Yeah. more YA as opposed to middle age. Yeah. Yeah, it all moved to television, right? 
Like it was just yeah, TV just, shows. Yeah. So I think people saw that as the bigger money. And so they ended up moving in that direction without really considering that the, the, the trajectory was that it went from the comics to the shows or to the movies, you know, and people, I think people want to skip that first part. <laughs> they just yeah. want to skip the, the whole gestation process of the creating a, a, you know, some kind of property. I think they don't want to go through the, to the, through the growing pains or, or whatever, whatever it is um, of seeing something like grow up with a generation. I think everyone wants it now, right? They want things go quickly. Right. Yeah. You know, they don't want to think about the future. And for me, I've been watching generation after generation of readers now, like maybe two to three generations of readers coming in and out of my books, you know, and, and like not, not generation, like, you know, 10, 15 yeah, years, no. but, but like just like classes, like, you know, the, sure. like kids who would have, kids who were born when, when Amulet One came out are the current readers of Amulet right now, you know, that they would be, you know, they'd be 12 years old. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, seeing that, like, you know, you realize that, um, you know, there's a cycle of life and it's nice. And I like, I like writing for that and not to try to stick with one group and just ride them all the way out to the sun, into the sunset. <laughs> yeah. That's what was, that was exactly what was going to happen. You know, and that was one of the joys of, of seeing what, uh, Brian Bendis did when they rebooted Spider-Man. You know, now all of a sudden it became accessible again. It was it was okay. young and it was yeah. hip, and you know that was that was something. And and Runaways, these were books that I could share with my child. You know, right? Um, because they were accessible and they were light and they were fun again. And, yeah. and they're they're the type of books that brought me back in. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, um. So Amulet is really kind of, you know, become the, the defining, uh, uh, I don't know, work of your career so far. Um, would you mind, uh, Kazush, uh, showing us some of uh, the process of drawing some of the characters? Or oh, yeah. Or work just, you put in? Just do some, uh, yeah, sure, why not? Let's go to the camera there. Um, yeah, gosh, I don't really want to draw right now. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean. To, I'm, I didn't oh no, 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 no! It's not your. I'm just. I'm just feeling. That's just how I'm feeling right now. Um, sure, sure. See, but um, yeah. I mean, the process is is pretty simple. I actually um, I, I used so when I when I was in high school, I was often known for my inking skills. I used to use a quill and ink with like line variation and do cross hatching and things like that. I was. I don't know if I was practicing to be an inker, but that was the first job that was offered to me was to be a background inker. Um, and I, I carried that through college and I did it on Copper Comics and things like that after college. But um, eventually I, I realized that it was just too slow um, to, to use ink, uh, like, a, like a, a nib and ink. And, you know, unless you're using a brush, the brush is fast enough, but you got to wait for the ink to dry. I, I've, I found that um, that I can get what I want with just pencils. So I don't use ink anymore. I just use a blue pencil and a graphite pencil. And that's pretty much it. So I do all my books with these. Um, Sharpies I use for presentations and also for signing books. Um, but, um, but yeah, I can, I can uh, show you what it looks like when I, when I do a drawing. Um, you know, I'll, I'll begin with uh, a blue pencil, uh, usually it's a, a sketch of the character, you know, get the position and, um, you know, the details, just kind of rough everything in. So how much do you draw from when, when you're doing such a stylized style that you do, mm -hmm. um, Kazoo, how much do you draw from, um, from life? How much do you look at people and go, oh, that's a pose or, or is this all just coming from inside I, of you? I, yeah, I don't, I don't look at, I don't look at things cause I don't want to, I, I kind of, this is just for me. I, this is not like what you supposed to do but for me i want to be fast <laughs> i want to i want to be fast at drawing so i don't want to rely on references for anything okay. okay so um so i try to build everything like i'm building with legos or something oh. so i you know I, I i think of everything even the characters is like as if i i kind of built them up with legos 
And if I can do that, then I don't need anything to start, you know, start drawing or make make a scene. Um, you know, like uh, let's uh, let's see, what can I put in the back here? Um, This guy's not an object, but he you know, basically kind of is like a tank. So, sure, I can. It's very interesting that that it's uh, the speed because it does the finished product looks like you know strenuous, deep work. And um, not to say that your style isn't, but but the speed in which you're working is is fantastic. It's amazing. Yeah, the, so I wanted the, the drawings to feel like, you know, like if I, it was like I'm a director, right? So I'm a director and I'm directing the scenes. I want to make sure that I'm not like stuck. I'm not stuck um, shooting, you know, too, too, like spending too much time shooting the scene, you know, and, and shooting the scene means drawing the scene. So right. the faster I can draw, the more I can shoot. Um, I used to, you know, um, well, so this is this is generally the process I would use. I would use pencil, go right over the blue. Um, you know, I'll just I'll just keep doing it. Um, but but drawing um, drawing quickly allows me to shoot more coverage, so I can mess up a scene faster and and, and go back and shoot <laughs> shoot it again. Um, yeah, so I, I you know I I come from you know a live action background, so. Um, I never wanted to do animation. That was something that people thought I would want to do, but I felt like animation strength is in, in, in like capturing movement. And, and though I in, am interested in, in doing that, it's not really my thing. I, I'm not really interested, that interested in just the, just the, just the act of making something move around, you know? Um, if I was, then I'd, I'd, I'd be making animated films. Um, but I was more interested in the stories and the character interactions and just the drama in general. So I wanted to, I wanted to focus on that. And um, that meant I, I would draw not to be able to animate everything. I wanted to draw quickly so I could tell more story. So the yeah, less time good. I have to, the less time I have to worry about details, um, um, the more I could, well, here I'll, I don't know. Normally he doesn't carry two swords, but I'll just put put it in there anyway. Um, yeah, the the I just want I just want to be able to to focus on the drama. It's very interesting because your 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 product, you know, I mean, your characters have energy on the page, Kazu, and and uh, the fact that you know I could see this as animated, and I. I you know, I, I visited with uh, uh, Jeff Peterson about the same with Mouse Guard, and uh, he said the same until, you know, he was approached and the money was too much. You know, and of course, it went into production. But, yeah, it's it's very interesting because I see this as a a easily animated project. I don't mean that as in the process being easy. Sure. But, but it, it, it appeals so much to the, to the eye and the story – writes itself for an animated series. That's not something you have interest in doing? Um, I, I do. And okay. I'm, it looks like, um, well, I, I, I don't while I'm, I'm busy working on the book. And one of the things that, uh, that was, um, so, so my, fo my, my biggest priority was my family. So I sure. wanted to be able to raise my kids without, without leaving them in the dust. Yes. And if I was to direct, I feel like that very well could have happened because I won't let my, I won't let my crew down. I mean, people know me. I know when I'm on a project, I don't let, I don't let my people down and I don't want to have to make that choice between my kids and my crew. Yeah. And that happens. Yeah. I think more off, more uh, uh, like on a, on a regular basis and people don't like to talk about it, you know, because I mean, that's just, they'll just say, well, that's just part of the business. Right. And I didn't want that. So, um, you know, even if comics meant I make less money, um, I just thought, well, at least I'm going to have time with my kids and I'll have, and, I'll have, and I didn't even have kids. <laughs> I just, I was raised with, you know, by a mom who was there for us all the time. 
I know the value of that. It's a big, big deal. So I wanted to make sure that I had something like that. When I watched Totoro uh, by Miyazaki, yeah. I was yeah. so inspired and I think I was more inspired by the vision of the dad living in the woods with his kids <laughs> than I was by the actual creative act of making the movie. Wow. Like I was so into the story. That's what, that's what really, I think really got me. Um, and so, um, yeah, but now my kids, they can, they can do a lot on their own now. You know, they're, they're, they're a lot older. Um, they, 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 they thank me for all the years that I've done this <laughs> and that feels good. And, you know, and now, um, you know, I just feel like there's, there's an opportunity as I come to the end of this series, like I have a chance to, to remap my schedule now and sure. I will have more time for projects actually in a couple of years. Cause my, my kids will be, I mean, my, my older one will be by then in the middle of middle school. Um, and, uh, the younger one will be entering middle school about that time too. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, y y you know what it's like a little bit like, you know, kids, like as they Absolutely. get older, yeah, they just, yeah. they just don't need you as much. And then, you know, they just become part of the family. And so that's where, that's where I'm coming to. And now I'm realizing that I might be able to entertain the idea of going back into making a film. And if I do that, uh, you know, I mean, I could do that with Amulet, I guess. Yeah, Amulet would be, I mean, and, and what a great time because, you know, with the advent of, of Netflix and Prime and Hulu, you know, and, and so many different platforms, they're looking for content. And, and some of the content is really good. Uh, Derek and I have fallen in love with uh, Del Toro's uh, uh, series on, um, on Netflix and, and, mm -hmm. I think that there's some really good stuff out there. And like I say, when I, when I read Amulet, I see it on the screen. Um, and a yeah. lot of that has to do with the action, the, the power of the characters that you've created, Kazu. Yeah, and surprisingly, you know, no producers or, you know, screenwriters have been able to get it to work. I mean, they've, um, they've tried. <laughs> a lot of A-list people have tried. And it just never worked. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna square that one up. Maybe it was just destined destined to be a certain way, and maybe I'm destined to help make this movie in a way that, sure. we, like Miyazaki and Katsuhiro Otomo, worked on their their movies, whether it's Akira or Nausicaa. I think those are the two um, uh, guide guide stones on this one. You know, they might be the the thing to look at. Sure. So, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, so maybe I don't know. I'm not going to officially announce that I'm working on a movie. Well, no. Yeah. yeah. No, I get it. I get it entirely. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, so with your so, anyway, what, so that's that's kind that's, of the process right there. Just drawing, that's beautiful. you know, with blue, blue pencil, and then you can, you know, you know finish it with uh, graphite pencil. And of course, you can you can do that on panels and stuff like that, too. So, um, so fast. I can't believe that you did it finished that fast. That's amazing. So, <laughs> all right. I'll come back. All right. Yeah. So um, thank yeah, you for no, sharing I, that. Yeah, that, no dude. problem. Thank you for. Yeah, so so the the drawing actually doesn't take me that much time. Um, that's why I don't get worried when I don't have enough drawings done. I ha I'm much more worried if the story isn't really fully baked. And a lot of times I have to bake it before the bread is ready. Um, and it happens. It's just the nature of deadlines and being professional. Number nine, I have decided I'm not going to bake any of the bread until it is fully ready. <laughs> really? And yeah, so this okay. is the only okay. book. This is, will be the only book that I have ever done where I'm working a lot, but I'm not working like behind. I've always felt behind and that includes number eight. And I, when I look back at number eight, I just, I just wish I, I, I wish I had a little more time. I, I just, you know, but it was crazy. Like it was so crazy. I put myself in the hospital because I worked so hard and, oh. and I don't want to do that to my family again. Um, you know, I don't want to do that to Scholastic again. I don't want I don't want anybody to have to worry about me. So number nine, I am not going to do that, like that kind of crazy, those kinds of crazy hours, but I am putting in more time to think about everything. And I've, and I'm, it's going to be done when it's done. And that's about it. And I, it's, I told everybody, like, I'm, I'm not even going to think about scheduling. I don't care what anybody says. I'm just going to only do it the way I think it should be done. And this will be the first graphic novel that I've done in this way. And, and I think it's going to feel more dense 
in the way that something like like I don't want to make this I don't really want to make this comparison but I think I think that the one that comes up in my mind is Watchmen when I read Watchmen it's dense in 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 not not like in information but in thought like when I yeah. read it there's there's a lot like some it's like Alan Moore was thinking about this book for a long 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 time and then just put it out there you know um yes and and so I have haven't I've only had I haven't had any time to do that with any of the Amazon books up to this point where I just feel like I've been just racing to keep up with the scheduling and so number nine is the first time I'm doing that and we'll see maybe people will hate it so I mean you know maybe maybe they just won't like me spending too much time thinking <laughs> it's possible but they should it should feel bigger than the other books even though it's the same size sure Sure, sure. But the density, I like the, the way you described that, the density of the story, the density of the storytelling, what happens in the process as you grow to it, because this is yours. I mean, it's not like you're playing in somebody else's sandbox. This has to, you know, this is your house. You know, you have mm -hmm. to decorate it the way that you feel it needs to be decorated. And then we're privileged enough to be invited into your home and see that decoration. And, and I, I love that. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's I I, I do like sharing the house. <laughs> yeah, I no, like I get it. Not for everybody, yeah. No, no, but it's yeah. you know I don't uh, I don't get too precious about the story. So I, I get if I get precious about anything, I get precious about about you know doing what I feel is best for the readers. Sure. That that's that's like I feel like if I do right by them, I when I'm at the end of my life, I can close my eyes and feel like I did okay. That's yeah. kind of where I want to be. Where I'd be like they'll know I'm a good dude because I did that <laughs> sure. and, and that sure. I can live with that, you know, uh, or I can, I can, I can, I can go to sleep with that. And, um, and so this last book has been, been really challenging because I have to do so much and so little space. And, you know, I know that it can be done, but it just requires more time than I've ever spent on anything. Um, yeah. and, and it'll show, I think when they read the book, they'll be like, how, how did he do that? <laughs> I'm hoping that this will be the case. They'll be like, how did he do that? How did a book this size feel this big? How did that happen? Because I think it can happen. I've seen it done. I've seen it done by Jack Kirby. I've seen it done, yep. you know, in Watchmen. I've seen it. You've seen it in comics, but it happens yep. so rarely. It's a very rare, rare event. But I believe that if you put the energy and time and thought and like you know, preloaded thinking and preparation, I think it can be, I think it could be just, you know, like it could be a design thing. You could do it. I think so. Yeah. That's the hypothesis. We'll see how it goes. Um, yeah. 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 Let me tell you, number eight that you said, I wish I could put more time in number eight. Let me share something with Kazoo. I, <laughs> my, I, I live in a small, I live in a small suburb of Sioux Falls. It's uh, 3,500 people roughly. And, and uh, in my son's class, there are three classes of, 22 to 25 kids. So let's say he has 75 classmates. When eight came out and I picked up Derek from school, I bet 30 kids had number eight in their hands <laughs> as that they had bought from the, the scholastic book, you know, so the scholastic yeah. bookmark comes around and they can, they can order. Right. Yeah. So they all come up, they all come home and they're like, what do you want to order? What, what do you want to get? And that day of order, when eight hit their grubby little fingers, they were, it, it wasn't in their backpack. Uh -huh. It was in their it was in their hands <laughs> as they came out of Del Rapids uh, Middle School. They were ready for that book. Yeah. And, and, and when you talk about you know the connection and at the end of your life, and let me tell you what, in this little town in uh, southeastern South Dakota, you've made an impact. Uh, these kids treasure your books. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Derek was mad because I had pre-ordered I had pre-ordered Derek's. So he did, he got it after the other kid, <laughs> other kids did. So uh -huh. he was really mad at me. So everybody else got their number eight. Where's mine? <laughs> oh no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I didn't realize it was going to be offered that way. So it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to figure out where it's going to come out first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, what role do you think that that uh, libraries? Because that's where um. In the previous time I worked at, I, I assisted at the library in ordering graphic novels, and uh, 
young adult and middle reader and even young reader and, uh -huh. and trying to get uh, sequential art into that. Do you think that libraries have, have helped a lot with the, the popularity of Amulet? I personally feel that they do. I mean, I think they're front yeah. center on oh, a yeah. lot of them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I don't know that it would be so successful without the libraries. I, I think a lot of my readers don't have a lot of extra income to purchase purchase the books for themselves too you know I, I think a lot of my readers can't afford them so um the library would be the only way they can they can actually get something like this um and and so i and and, and it creates like this communal you know sharing of the book where you know just right. like what's great about graphic novels in libraries is they can circulate so much faster than regular books you know because people yes. can read them we can they can read them faster so they can be handed to the next person so within the same time frame of like a Lord of the Rings copy going from place to place, um, from one reader to the next, like a graphic novel may have circulated 10 times. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. One of our uh, charities for SuperCon is uh, Reach Literacy and, and uh, they work very hard, uh, not only in adult literacy, but for catching young people up to, to reading levels they should be at. Uh, and one of the things that they've embraced is uh, the graphic novel and, mm -hmm. and getting that into not only young readers that are struggling, but older readers that have slipped through the, through the cracks, so to speak, and, and not um, uh, developed the reading skills that they should at their level. And graphic novels are so accessible, right? Because it's imaginative. It's what happens uh, between the lines. As you know, Scott McCloud said, what, what happens in the gutter. And, and yeah. I can look at it and have the story presented. And I, mm -hmm. I, I really envy uh, those of you that are able to do that with such, uh, you know, to master that and, and be able to share that with the rest of the world. Yeah, it's hard. I, I think, you know, not all graphic not all graphic novels work for those audiences too. You know, sometimes it, sometimes it you know, um, the information isn't portrayed in such a way that it's um, intuitive. Yeah, and, and and it's one of the reasons why if you're a writer and artist, you know, you have a bit of an advantage because you're both. You can you can lean on e either either thing whenever you had you know depending on the content. Like sometimes the pictures are what's going to tell the story. Sometimes it's 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 going to have to be the dialogue, and you'll know better when that is, and you won't have to you know you won't have to like uh, read the mind of your reader, uh, the writer, or if you if you're the if you're the artist. And if you're the writer, you don't have to read the mind of the artist. Sure. Um, a lot of times I feel like a lot of superhero comics, um, sometimes I feel that they're competing. The writers and the artists are competing. Yep. And so they don't really work together. They don't always work together very well. Um, sometimes it works really, really well. You know, uh, we've, seen, we've seen that happen too. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, no, I think it's um, with, with the graphic novel, um, we're still trying to figure out I think people are just still trying to work out like what actually works because as much as graphic novels are more successful these days, it's only a really a handful of graphic novels. It's not really, right. it's not like every graphic novel you put out on your, on the shelf is, is, is right. like a big hit uh, with yeah. the kids. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I appreciate you, uh, what you're seeing about the writer artist combination because personally I found myself drawn to, you know, uh, uh, Los Bros Hernandez, Jeff Meyer, mm -hmm. uh, Terry Moore, and you're right. There is there. This is their image. This is when, like with yours. This is your image. And when I when relying on one strength or the other, as you as you said, because there will be pages like in Terry Moore's writing where it's just a, a static character and text, mm -hmm. and then the next page will be very much animated and very much going. You know so. Yeah, yeah, actually, with those particular examples, when I look at Terry Moore's work and I look at the Hernandez brothers, I feel like the faces look like words. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful. Yes, yes, Kazu. Yeah. I, I, I immediately I understood what you meant because yes, there's there is almost that that connection of the flow of the way it's presented. Yes, it's all about their faces. The these, you know, that's like their stages. I think when they're, when they're drawing, I get the feeling that they're trying to express somebody's like um, inability to express with words what they could express with their face. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Yeah, it's yeah. pretty neat. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't do that if you're if you're not both the writer and the artist. Actually, it would be right. well. You could, but you it would be much harder. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Because it's just it's there. This is mine, and when I'm inspired to do this, there it is. Right. Yeah. And, and uh -huh. I don't have to give that to someone else. Yeah. And I feel I feel that way when I'm writing too. I just feel like if I didn't have control of the faces, I don't know if I could write this book. Like I I, I need I need that. <laughs> I, I work yeah. off of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I have I have one question from my son Derek. Okay. And uh, as before we wrap up, he wanted to know if you write this for your children. Um, or if your writing changed and now you write for them. No, no, actually I don't because they have me around all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they know that. So they're actually on my team helping the readers. So they're they're like my first read first pass editors more so they're like coworkers more than they are my audience. Okay. So yeah, okay. you know, with my kids, like I don't and I don't think of my books as my kids. I don't think of pets as my kids. I don't. Sure. My yeah. kids are your my children kids. are your children. Yeah. Yeah, my kids. The, the, you know, they're they're like you know that's that's my family. That's my family moving forward. You know. So. Yeah. I, and and now they're and as they're reading these books and stuff, um, you know they. You know, they, they have a, a pretty good understanding of what it is I do and what's what's going on here. They've had to like also deal with having a dad who's a bit of a celebrity in their schools, you know, <laughs> every sure. time they go yeah. somewhere. So we've had to explain like Amy, Amy does most of this and she's she's the one really like she's in charge of really like she's the in charge of the house, you know, and, and raising the kids and and, 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 and making sure I'm still alive. <laughs> 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 and so you know so she's really the mastermind behind the the kibushi household um but uh but yeah so we're um we we have to we 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 prepared our kids to deal with questions they would get from other kids and like uh, you know the, and how to how to deal with that and make sure that they are valued as for who they are right, and right. and i always explain to them too that they're they always come first for me you know, and no matter how much I, I have to work on this stuff or how many readers there might be. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I, I that's, so that's the thing. So for my kids, you know, it's like a whole different thing. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Um, and they do help though. They, they look at the stuff and they'll tell me like Junie was reading my amulet, um, amulet nine and asked him what he thought he said. He's just like, you know, I was like, this is really good. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's good. You know, and he's he's a he's exactly the age. Right. You know, but he's also a writer too. So he's, you know, so he's learning and he's he's working on his own projects and things. And he's 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 got his imagination is like always on fire. So I, I love he does. I love so every after every amulet, after every uh, uh, Hilo, and after every Miles Morales book that Derek gets. And he sits down and he writes, but he doesn't write your characters or Judd's characters or Brian's characters. He writes his characters because he's so inspired by looking at your stuff. That's great. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. It's, you know, and it, whether that's the path he goes down or not, just to be able to inspire imagination so much that a child feels compelled in this world of <laughs> iPad and, and video games and everything else, feels compelled to get out a piece of paper and, and draw. Yeah. And that's, that's so you've given a gift out there in this household and I imagine many other guys do. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil what I may be doing next, but I think I'm going to, I think it'll be something that will, will play really well to an audience of, of people who want to make their own graphic novels. So that's something that, you know, I think I'm, I'm looking right. forward to doing. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, I, uh, I, this has been wonderful. I've enjoyed speaking with you. I've enjoyed this time. I hope that someday, uh, when deadlines are a little looser and uh, travel is safe and, and we can coerce you to come out to South Dakota and yeah. visit with us in person. I would love to have you at Supercon. Um, yeah. yeah. But I, I do appreciate this time, Kazu. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. This has been great. So this is, um, thanks for having me on, you know, and uh, if yeah. you see any of my other friends along the way here, I tell them I said hi <laughs> and I hope they're doing I, I, well. <laughs> I will. I will for sure. Um, and from a personal note, uh, when when uh, Phil Hester put out the the call for for sketches for my son that he could take with him to his chemo, from a personal note, you were 
one of the first ones to respond. Yazoo. And uh, from one father to another, um, I can't repay that, but thank you. Oh, no, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm a part of this. So. This is great. Yeah. You are the, you are, you are the front page, but second because uh, Phil's beat you. So, uh, <laughs> so every, every, every chemo, he would take those books along. And when uh -huh. he opened, there was uh, Batman fighting Hawkman. And there was the amulet cast, the first oh, nice. pictures he saw. So That's thank great. you for that. Thank You're you welcome. For it. Yeah. Continue to be safe and best to your family, Kevin. And you too. Yeah. I hope you guys are doing well up there. And, uh, you know, at least you don't have the fires. So we'll That's, right. That. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so I'm speaking to you from within the smoke. It's a, uh, but it's, it's, it'll, it'll all work. So, all right. Absolutely. Okay. Take well, care. Good night. Good night.